All right. So um, what I love about this, uh, you have this uh, tag line about medicine, uh, technology, humanity. I don't know who came up with that. Was it you, Rafi? <laughs> okay, your team. But this is something that is not typical. Most people think technology is not humanity. And I'm going to try to convince you during my time with you that that is indeed the case, that we can make the bond of patients to doctors more intimate through technology rather than less. And we can take medicine to a whole new level. Before I get too deep into this, I'd like to know from this, the Digirati here, how many of you are active on Twitter? Okay, six people. Okay, I want to suggest that you get more active because if we all share more, we get smarter more. And uh, I think this is something that we could all do better because it's all about, as you know, here uh, in, in uh, Haifa and Rambam, about innovation, it's about open science and open uh, data. So um, the way we practice medicine today is at the 30,000 foot and beyond level. We don't understand each human being. We see them in a very ambiguous way. And the reason that, of course, is leads us to the blind men and the elephant when we see each patient. Because we don't really understand them in any granular fashion. And so to give you some examples of this problem, uh, Bill Brody and I were talking about this uh, on the trip here. That is, today in the US, 7,000 people download the guidelines from the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, to find out if they should take a statin. The only problem with these guidelines are, as it's been shown recently, is that they project a five-fold increased risk compared to the actual risk that was recently shown, which is really remarkable. Here are the 10 top medications in gross sales in the United States. The people pictured to be pink are the non-responders. Only 20% of the top drugs used today actually have a clinical response. And recently, the people at Johns Hopkins showed that the leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer is medical errors. Medical errors. So we don't understand people to try to transcend these problems, to give better care for each individual. And so this brings us to the point that we cannot tolerate average mass medicine any longer. These books have nothing to do with medicine, but at the same time, everything to do with medicine. So that's why we need to bring Moore's Law to medicine. And you can see that this is the last 50 years of Moore's Law is an acceleration of technology acceptance. This is in the US, more than one fourth of people adopting a new technology. You saw how long it took back in the uh, 1800s with electricity, it took two years for a fourth of Americans to use a smartphone, and now it's almost 80%. And to give you a little more quantitation about Moore's Law, because you may not think about this too often, we're talking about, in 2016, 19 million transistors in a 10 nanometer chip. That's a lot of transistors. So when you think about where is medicine today, here's this Moore's Law going on the rest of the world, and in the medical microcosm, there's, we're already in the fourth revolution in the rest of the world. We have uh, AI, big data, robotics, but medicine is stuck in the early part of the third industrial revolution. And so this is the problem. This is medicine today. We have wireless medicine in the hospital room? No. How about the Holter monitor that's still being used? with wires that people can't exercise and take a shower. How about the stethoscope, which is a relic analog instrument? Or when people do exercise tests, and the nurse listens to a blood pressure while the person's exercising, which you can't even hear. This is crazy. We have not brought technology to medicine, or Moore's Law. Most people don't realize that the each smartphone has more than two billion transistors in a smartphone. That's Moore's Law in operation, and we are heading towards a planet of phones, the phone being the hub of the future of medicine. So this has also created some liabilities. We have a new species of man as a result of this. It's called homo distractus. 
And uh, you can see that um, I put out a, 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 to the Twitterverse, so I put out that um, the average attention span has been dropping. In 1998, it was 12 minutes. In 2008, it was five minutes. I asked, what is it now? I got a response in nanosecond from a doctor, a doctor. And he said, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> so these devices have changed our world, except in medicine, of course. And uh, this is my favorite. He looks so natural. Um, <laughs> so we have this smartphone, which has not really hit medicine yet. It's just getting started. But I'm going to try to convince you it will become transformative for the future of medicine and take on all these functions. We can digitize a human being. That's an extraordinary new capability. And we'll talk about what that is. You heard about CRISPR and being able to genome editing. That's just one dimension of, of digitizing a human being. Sensors that are now capable of tracking any organ, any organ system of the body through wearables or even embeddable or digestible sensors. Sequencing. We are now past a million people who have been sequenced on the planet, and it's projected by 2025, which is not that far from now. There will be over a billion people sequenced, over a billion people sequenced. Um, so we have this new uh, concept, and I've written about this, about individualized medicine. Uh, I called it from pre-room to tomb. Some people recently have more uh, referred to it as uh, from uh, lust to dust. Um, <laughs> now, what this is about is the fact that you can make a Google medical map. Several layers of each human being, like a, the street view, traffic view, uh, the satellite view of a map, of a, a geography. Now you can do this of a human being. The external features, the, uh, the physiology through sensors, the anatomy, the anatome through uh, imaging, and all the different biologic layers that include the DNA, proteins, uh, the RNA, uh, the microbiome, the metabolites, the uh, epigenome, side chains, and of course the exposome, the environment that we can quantify now through sensors. And so these are all these smart uh, attachments to a phone that transform its capability to do things that most people would not even have envisioned. But I wanted, before getting to that, mention how the doctor's bag has changed, or it could change, I should say, because this doctor's bag, pictured in 1911, is the same as what a doctor carries around today. Every piece of equipment is analog. It doesn't record anything. It's terribly inaccurate. And this is not, of course, acceptable in a digital era. This is what is a component of my bag. And every piece is digital. It can be used equally as well by a patient as well as a doctor. And it records, and you transmit the data. And it is a completely different world that we have today if we take advantage of it, which largely we don't. I'm going to just show you some devices. I haven't used a stethoscope in over six years. And it isn't because I'm not seeing patients, but it's because this device is amazing. This is actually a Philips product, which has a transducer that you pop into a droid smartphone. And you have imaging that's as good as the $350,000 ultrasound machine in the hospital. So here is the heart. You can see in seconds every aspect of the heart the size of the chambers, the valves, the thickness of the heart muscle, everything. Why would you listen to Lub Dub? <laughs> Why? When you can see it in seconds. And not only that, but you can share it with the patient and say, look, your heart muscle's sick, or with the color flow, this valve is leaking, the order is thick, is widened, anything you can see in seconds. Why would you use a stethophone, which is not a stethoscope when we have a stethoscope today. And some people say, oh, well, you just picked the best images. Everyone can be imaged. This is a man with a BMI of greater than 45. And the images are still of excellent quality, every patient. So I thought this is great. You can do the heart. But what about the rest of the body? 
So early this year, I went and did a head-to-toe exam on myself. Talk about a medical selfie. <laughs> I did ultrasound of the carotid arteries, the sinuses, thyroid, lung, heart. Uh, I hadn't even known what these looked like. I had to find out. The liver, gallbladder, <laughs> kidney, iliac artery, spleen, aorta, inferior vena cava, popliteal fossa, and my left foot. Everything. <laughs> the entire body. Through a smartphone. Right. Now, why is this important? I don't know the statistics in Israel, but in the U.S., over 130 million people have an ultrasound each year. That's of over just 300 million people. More than a third have an ultrasound study of some kind or another. And this, of course, is unnecessary if we just do this as part of the physical exam. We would preempt at least 70% of unnecessary ultrasound studies. And we can do a cardiogram. Why would you check the pulse when you can do, with the fingers, a six-lead electrocardiogram to the smartphone, and moreover, that the patient can do it themselves whenever necessary and get a computer algorithmic interpretation. And they can buy this through Amazon for $69. Why would you have a regular cardiogram when you can get this type of information? And why would you wear a watch that doesn't get your blood pressure anymore? We have a device like Amron it's coming out soon that gets your blood pressure when you just touch it and you get uh, a readout. And soon we'll have a blood pressure that's continuous, passive, which you don't even have to press for start. Glucose. Now we can get glucose through a tiny, small sensor put on the abdomen or the arm and get a, a glucose readout any minute in time on your phone. Or you can glance at your watch and get your glucose. And it might change your eating habits, I can assure you. When you're looking at your watch and you're deciding whether you're going to eat this pastry or cookie or whatever, when you already know your glucose this is way out of whack. And the invasion of the tech titans, like this example of Google working with Dexcom, making sensors that are pre-calibrated, factory calibrated to preempt finger sticks in the future, cheaper than uh, the glucose strips to be used by billion people on the planet, potentially. So inexpensive and so much uh, easier to get continuous glucose than to get uh, episodic uh, finger sticks, which obviously require blood and uh, are not uh, free of pain. So that's something in the future that's going on right now. Then there's the ability to do a sleep study with a Band-Aid. And we've used this in our team in, uh, in uh, West Africa and diagnosed Ebola long before there was a fever, uh, and also Lassa fever. And this Band-Aid has all sorts of uh, capabilities except for blood pressure for monitoring vital signs. And it's remarkable what you can do when you have this kind of information. In, it, by the way, that Band-Aid costs a dollar to make. So we're talking about cheap chips. Or a ring from Finland that also does sleep studies. So to prevent the need for a hospital sleep lab. In the United States, it costs nearly $4,000 to have a sleep study. Who could have a normal sleep in a hospital sleep lab? <laughs> do you have those here, by the way, at Rambam? Oh my gosh. Why wouldn't you do that in your home for free? You might even sleep normally in your own bed. This past week, uh, our, our colleagues at UCSD, Jacobs Engineering, they actually were the first to publish a wearable sensor that does chemistries as well as vital signs. So one little patch that can do all these things. Talk about multi-sensor capability. And then Berkeley has published a remarkable series of sensor uh, capabilities from just putting on the skin. Don't even have to actually have sweat. And you can look at all the electrolytes, the kidney function, and so many other analytes wouldn't even need a blood stick, finger stick, because you can get this through the skin. Pretty remarkable. And this is using microfluidics, another uh, example of, uh, of Moore's Law and uh, cheap chips being able to get remarkable data that was previously unobtainable. So then I wanted to point out that the smartphone can be made to do the physical exam, almost every component of the physical exam. So the most common reason to take a child to the pediatrician is to get an ear exam to see if there's an ear infection. 
And I hadn't done uh, one of these ear exams in a long time, but I was uh, interested to have the chance to do this on uh, Stephen Colbert, who's an interesting <laughs> character. I thought I'd just show you that because it's uh, kind of interesting and amusing. I saw on Twitter that you had an eardrum. Yeah, injury. I went diving and I blew out my good eardrum so over I, here. I thought I could just take a look with the smartphone into your eardrum. Is that all right? Okay, yeah, sure. sure I'll just stand. I'll just stand over. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, really? stay right okay. there. Stay all right. right there. So, um, so basically, I put this right in here. Yeah. And I hope I don't hurt you at all. No, I hope so too. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> that hurt? No. Okay. And uh, I've got your eardrum. Uh huh. Right there. It's an eardrum, it's not my ass. Uh, I'll take God. By the way, could I get a colonoscopy with this thing? <laughs> okay, so you could do most of the exam. In fact, they're even making a colonoscopy, yes. Um, but you could do the eye exam, all the eye exam. And for people with Parkinson's disease, you can get the gait, tremor, voice, all analyzed, digitized the state of your, at moment of your Parkinson's disease to know whether you should take a medicine then or what dose. And you can do the same with asthma. And someday, hopefully, we can vo avoid asthma attacks because we can get so much information to preempt an attack before even there's any wheezing. These are exciting directions. And depression, of course, the number one cause of disability in the world. And we don't have enough mental health professionals to help this uh, burden, this significant problem. But we also know now that people trust uh, an avatar or a computer more than they do a psychiatrist or psychologist to reveal their most innermost secrets. Who would have ever guessed that? But they rather do this with not a human being. And so that has led to this whole idea, which is proliferating rapidly, of pocket psychiatry. <laughs> it's not, I'm not making this up. This is extremely popular now. Uh, it's textual healing, it's actually called. So this is the ability for people to make their own diagnosis and have their own monitoring. This is a very different look of healthcare. Never before has there been this uh, transfer of control and charge to the individual. So here is the status today. I don't know, of course, here at Rombaum, but any, or any U.S. hospital, it's, uh, I do your blood work, send it to the lab, and never get back to you the re results. Does anybody have that experience here? No? Oh, okay, well. Uh, anyway, that's not going to be the case because you do your own blood tests, or you could use your own skin as the way to get the analyte. And the blood finger stick, droplet of blood has an immense amount of information and it's very inexpensive to do this. And it will be the way you get routine lab tests. And already in the US, one of the biggest uh, of the two central labs called LabCorp has changed the whole model where people can order their own lab tests without having to go to a doctor because this transfer of control is getting legs now. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how powerful a drop of blood is, this is work from Harvard where you can get every virus you've ever been exposed to in your life and when from one droplet of blood for $25. That's pretty remarkable. And you can diagnose virtually any infection rapidly and inexpensively through a smartphone. Here in Rwanda, 99% accuracy diagnosis of HIV and syphilis through a smartphone. And of course, Zika, which is a very big concern right now. There's now ways to do this uh, very rapidly, inexpensively, and accurately. So this is happening throughout all the different types of pathogens that we know. But what we aren't doing is changing the way we approach people with serious infection. Because we can sequence the blood now, and very quickly, within an hour or two, find out what is the pathogen without waiting for days to give people empiric antibiotic coverage, which has its share of toxicities, no less expense, no less antibiotic resistance. And we're not doing that, but we need to do that because sequencing will be ubiquitous. It's now the size of a USB port, a thumb drive, to be able to do pathogen sequencing. And this is just gonna change the way our approach to infectious diseases. I'm not gonna go through all the, the, the different time points 
when individualized medicine will be taking hold. But I do want to uh, highlight a couple. And one is the fact that um, we are doing fetal sequencing. Most people don't understand how common this is. This is the most rapidly uh, used, adopted blood test in the history of medicine, non-invasive prenatal testing. In the last year in the US, where there's four million live births, a million pregnant women had a tube of blood between eight and 12 weeks to have their fetus sequenced because the fetal DNA in the plasma can be sequenced at low pass to determine whether there's a chromosomal abnormality such as trisomy 21. And this is the first woman who I got to know who's a physician, uh, Eunice Lee, an anesthesiologist, who when she was wait, waiting to get her results back was, gets a call from the obstetrician that in fact the fetal DNA was not the problem, but she was discovered to have tumor, tumor DNA in her plasma. And so she had a workup and it showed that she had colon cancer, a mass that was resected laparoscopically and later she gave birth uh, to Benjamin and she's done beautifully. But the point is, in healthy people, unsuspected, we can diagnose cancer through the plasma, through circulating tumor DNA which is really quite remarkable. Talk about being able to digitize cancer. So I want to just spend a few minutes, uh, moments on cancer because it is a genomic disease. And Rafi mentioned this at the outset this morning, that the heart disease, it sure hasn't gone away, but it's gotten much better over decades. Cancer hasn't really budged in any substantive way. And so the fact that now we can digitize a cancer is a really unique and new capability. So we can do the same type of Google map. Every person who has cancer has a unique biologic process, just like there's no two individuals, even identical twins, who are biologically the same. So we can do the mapping, and we can get a liquid biopsy at many time points with a single tube of blood to look for circulating tumor DNA and sequence that tumor DNA to find out what are the mutations. And so this can be done in potentially high-risk, healthy people because there's a family history of cancer, or it can be done in people who have been diagnosed or for long-term surveillance. And there's many different studies ongoing in each of these areas today. What's especially exciting is that now we can define the risk of familial cancer because for low-cost tests like this one and others, on the range of $200, one can get 30 different genes associated with familial cancer sequenced. Just a couple of years ago, that cost $4,000, and that was just for BRCA1 and 2. Now we can have you know, well over 30 uh, oncogenes uh, uh, sequenced, and that's really democratizing cancer genomics. So I want to just talk about the effects this is having on the healthcare system. So it isn't, this is first a hospital. It isn't particularly encouraging when you read headlines, hospitals are killing tens of thousands fewer people. That doesn't make you feel better. <laughs> Survive your stay at the hospital? What's wrong with this picture? So we need to get rid of hospital rooms. Okay, they're going to the home. I'm not talking about operating rooms and intensive care units and emergency rooms. I'm talking about the regular hospital room. Because maybe not in Israel, but in the US, you have one fourth chance to be harmed in the hospital. One out of four. And that hasn't changed in decades. So we have already facilities that are being built with no beds in the hospital. That's the future. And uh, what's especially interesting is the smart medical home can have all these sensors and devices to track people exquisitely, as, as well as an intensive care unit to have data surveillance of any individual. And already in St. Louis, there's a facility that is a, uh, a data surveillance center. We're going to be seeing a lot of these in the future. And I'm sure here in Haifa someday, there will be a data surveillance center of these two million people that you serve, that you can monitor them. And before they get sick, anticipate the other problems. Now, what about the clinic, where we go to the clinic to see the doctor? This isn't working very well in the US. Again, this is different here, I know. I'm sure. I'm sure it's great here. But in the US, it's different. 
In the US, it looks like this. The doctor's pecking on a keyboard, and the patient is exasperated. It takes, how long do you think it takes in the US to make an appointment to see the primary care doctor? Anybody? Six weeks is in Boston, but 2.6 weeks is the average. And when you get to see the doctor at the waiting room, you have to wait 61 minutes beyond your appointment to get to the doctor. This isn't working well. And you're for seven minute visit, that's right. So we need to flip this thing. And I thought you would appreciate this little video clip coming up here. Ms. Kelly, the doctor will see you now. Uh, can you let the doctor know that I'll be with him shortly? Huh? I am getting a lot of work done. Your Wi-Fi is very fast. But he's ready for you now. I'll be with him as soon as I can. Is she ready? Not yet. But you're next. That's the flip. That's the great inversion of medicine. And uh, it's happening. So, uh huh. Whoops. Do you have to give you an example? One of the hospitals, uh, to show you the, the, the change, one of the hospital health systems in the US, Geisinger, which is an exceptionally strong, uh, well regarded system in Pennsylvania, they started a new policy that if patients are not happy with their care, they have an app on their smartphone and they can say they're unhappy and they get a refund, a refund. Who ever heard of that in healthcare? Uh, so that's pretty striking. That's another uh, sign of the times. This whole idea of patient-centered medicine, this concept was introduced in 1969 and we haven't even come close to this. I don't even know why people can talk about that term. We don't do that, at least again in the United States, of course. Now, um, we have a new thing that's very popular now uh, which is telemedicine, teleconsults, and eventually these will become the dominant way instead of physical visits for most routine things. And these are the various companies that have made this uh, very popular and now are getting reimbursed and growing at 28% per year. And this is the new acronym for healthcare. You know what this stands for? I want what I want when I want it. Okay, and that's on demand because everyone's used to touching an app and getting whatever they want. And now they can get this for their medical care. So you can now, uh, for example, there's a, a Heal, which is one of these Uber doctor apps in Los Angeles and very popular throughout California now. You probably don't have anything like this here in Israel, but they go to the home. You touch the app and the doctor's on the way to the home. And this heel was actually backed by Lionel Richie. Uh, the, I don't know how he got involved with this, but I wrote to him, I said, Lionel, maybe you should have called this all night long. And then <laughs> he said, but doc, it's all day long too. So the point is, is that you can Uber a doctor now and there's most cities in the US, they come to your house. You touch the app, the doctor says, you don't have to wait for 2.6 weeks. You don't even have to have a televisit. You have an Uber doctor house call from your smartphone. So people are raising their status from passengers to co-pilots of their health care because of this portability of their medical data. And so unfortunately, the medical profession is highly paternalistic. And it doesn't believe that humans are capable of having their data. But it turns out that when you have this superimposed with machine support, algorithms, and machine learning for that individual, it takes the power of a person to an even higher level. And that's what is happening. And I tried to give you some examples. And these are some of the artificial intelligence companies, just some, that are working in making this all uh, the, the future of each person's care should they desire to go this route of more charge. And so instead of today where there's Siri and Cortana, there will be the doctor virtual assistants in your smartphone. And this will be, I think, uh, this is the fellow from IBM Watson who has projected there'll be more uh, virtual doctors than there will be uh, stethoscopes. Well, I don't know about stethoscopes because we need to fix that problem too. But the point is that we have this 
really exciting time in medicine, the most exciting time in the history of medicine. But I don't want to leave you with that it's all rosy. We have a little problem, and that's privacy and security because we are in this hyper-connected world. And this is a problem because some people have declared the end of privacy. That will not work for people's health, medical, sensitive, delicate data. So we have had, in the US, breaches of data. 100 million people in the US who had their electronic medical records hacked in the last year, as compared to only 5 million who ever accessed their medical records. So it's an epidemic. We also have hospitals that have been held hostage, paying ransoms to have become shut down hospital systems because their data systems were hacked and taken over. We've also, not just in the US, but in the UK, they, the, the, the citizens of the UK found out that their data had been given to Google. They weren't particularly happy about this. Um, so we have a problem that people don't own their data. They can't even get their data, no less own it. And it's being hacked. And that isn't acceptable. So we have to fix this problem. Now, I thought this cartoon would really exemplify the problem in the US. And I thought you might appreciate it. The little boy says, Dad says you're monitoring all our phone calls. <laughs> Obama says, he's not your dad. <laughs> right. Now, we have a little problem in the US. We have a little problem with our data. It's not exactly confidential, private. So it was actually gratifying to see uh, Obama uh, at the recent White House summit. He, 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 of course, this is not true, but uh, this is true. Who owns the data? And, and, and I would like to think that if somebody take, does a test on me or, or my genes, uh, that that's mine. But that's not always how we define getting these issues, right? For that. It's your data, you should own it. But that isn't the case today. It isn't the case in Israel, I don't think, right? But it's going to be the case someday. It should be a civil right. And in the US, only one state, New Hampshire, people own their data. They don't even know they own their data there. All the other states, the doctors and hospitals, own the people's data. That's not right. This needs to be fixed. And uh, it will be fixed eventually. There is a platform that can do this, blockchain which is a peer-to-peer -peer network not owned by any company or health system, which is a distributed electronic ledger. Every transaction, every data sharing will be, of course, recorded and encrypted and decrypted at will of the person who owns their data. And this is a decentralized system, which is the answer to the hacking that we've experienced uh, in the US. If you talk to any cybersecurity expert, you have to get the data out of mass server uh, uh, cumulative uh, uh, storage. So I just want to, uh, so this is a book that just came out last week, which is excellent if you're interested in this whole blockchain topic, which some people think is going to be even bigger than the internet. So I'll just leave you with that we are going to change this smartphone to medicalize it. It's going to have capabilities, already does, but many more over the next few years. It's extraordinary time in medicine, so exciting. And I also want to just emphasize back to your your uh, medicine, technology, humanity. This is not in any way, I hope I've convinced you, detracting technology, detracting from humanity, but rather enhancing dignity, enhancing the capability of each human being to take much more charge if they so desire for their health care. And let me just stop and thank uh, all the people that I uh, have the chance to work with at, at Scripps Research and Scripps Health and on our funding agencies. And thanks so much for your attention. Thank you.